Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another seminar of the Astronomy Department Cycle of Seminars. Many thanks for joining us uh, here in the Google Meet or if you are following us through our YouTube channel. Today, we are very pleased to have Professor Sarah Seeger. Many thanks, Sarah, for your presence here. Um, Sarah Seeger got her PhD from Harvard University, and she is currently a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her seminar research in the field of exoplanet atmosphere is worldwide recognized, as well as her current research that focuses on exoplanet atmosphere and the search for signs of life. And she will precisely talk about this subject today, exoplanets and the search for atmospheric biosignature gases. Um, before we start, I will ask everyone, please turn off your microphones and your cameras during the presentation. And if you have a question, raise your hands here in the Google Meet, or you, can, you could write it down in the chat of the YouTube, and the question will be asked after the presentation. So, Sarah, whenever you are ready, you can start presenting. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you the latest on the search for signs of life beyond Earth. Many of you know that a few billion years ago, the humble cyanobacteria discovered photosynthesis. They figured out how to gain energy from the sun and in the process have a waste byproduct of oxygen gas. Now it's really amazing because our own earth atmosphere has 20% oxygen by volume, but without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, our atmosphere will have virtually no oxygen. Now I bet a number of you have heard of the famous astronomer James Jeans. Jeans. He actually, 80 years ago or so, he realized that oxygen would be a good sign of life on another world. So it's amazing to think of that, of oxygen as having been something astronomers considered for, for that long. So when I think about stars in our night sky, and I hope that there's planets around those stars and intelligent life on those planets, with telescopes like we have, or we're trying to build, and they look back at Earth, if they see oxygen, they'll be suspicious because it's such a reactive gas, it shouldn't be in our atmosphere at all. Well, for astronomers here, you know that they're probably, if they see oxygen, said hypothetical aliens are probably fighting over data analysis. They probably don't believe that it's made by life. Who really knows? So today I'm gonna to talk about biosignature gases. I'll be talking about Venus. And then I'll return to exoplanets. So there's one thing though that has, has stuck with me throughout the years and been a kind of guiding principle. And that is this quote that I found about 15 years ago. And this quote says, nothing would be more tragic in the exploration of space than to encounter alien life and fail to recognize it. And why this is so key is because our own Earth, we only had significant oxygen in our atmosphere for the past billion years. And who knows if we look at another planet, whether the life there makes oxygen or not. So for most of Earth's life, we didn't have like oxygen was produced by life and it took a very long time to saturate and accumulate in the atmosphere. So I've always um, have it in my mind is what other gases should we be thinking about? So believe it or not, my team went on a giant, let's call it a journey in a field I call chemical space. You can literally use your computer to generate all kinds of molecules. People in the drug discovery fields, they'll make like more than a trillion molecules. They can literally make 10 to the 20 molecules in their computer. We don't want that many molecules, but I was trying to understand what are all the possibilities of molecules that are in gas form on a habitable world? And which one of these should we add to our list so that we don't miss any biosignature gases? Well, it turns out it's not just oxygen, Here's an interesting fact you can uh, share with your friends, is that every gas in Earth's atmosphere that is present to the part per trillion level, and that's a small amount, part per trillion, aside from the noble gases, 
So all the gases in our atmosphere to the part per trillion value are actually made by life. Most of them have another source, a dominant source that isn't life. But to me, it's just astonishing that, that the gases are all made by life. Ozone, for example, it is made inside some cells. So my team actually went on a giant, um, in over like literally 10 years, we created molecules in our computer. We checked existing databases in chemistry to see whether these molecules actually exist, are stable. We have another database of all the gases produced by life on our planet, all the molecules produced by life, whether they're gas, liquid, or solid. And we worked out um, a lot of incredible things. I wish I had time to share it all with you. In this picture, there's a sea of molecules in the distance in what we call chemical space. Some of them make it through our shaker filter, which represents our algorithms that sort all the molecules. Some of these molecules, as you see on the right side, they uh, go towards a hypothetical planet showing the hope that we can understand all the range of gases we should be paying attention to. Some of these on the left, it's a different story, but we discovered also that some molecules or fragments of molecules are nearly completely avoided by life. And we ended up going on a tangent outside of astronomy to follow that up. So it's, I can't, um, won't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, chasing fool's gold, like a journey to understand, compelled to understand all molecules, because I'll come back to later in my talk, it's really hard to, to make observations of atmospheres. And it's not clear if we could ever, ever um, do it justice, you know, to find concrete, robust signs of individual gases. Nonetheless, what we do is we start with the database of molecules that are in gas form. We call this all small molecules for just our database name. Then we ask, do any of these molecules have spectra? And by the way, our database has about 15,000 molecules that are in, in gas form. And about a quarter of those are made by life on Earth. Only about 600 have spectra that have been either taken like in the 1950s when people used gas cells to measure cross sections and about maybe less than 100 have computer generated through quantum mechanical calculations, molecular line lists. Anyway, we take a molecule of interest or we also, um, and we put it through our spectral simulator and we ask ourselves, is the molecule something that we could detect that is unique? Like, does the molecule have its own special spectral window? If the molecule looks like it's decent, like it, you could distinguish it from another spectral feature, then we move to an evaluation phase where we put our molecule through atmospheric chemistry models. Because photochemistry, ultraviolet radiation from the host star, usually destroys molecules very rapidly. So molecules made by life that percolate up through the atmosphere, they typically get destroyed either directly by ultraviolet or indirectly through radical gases. Well, if the molecule can survive photochemistry, it's a good potential biosignature gas. And then we further study the gas. We ask ourselves, is it produced by life on Earth? Can we learn anything from its presence on Earth? Very important is, does the gas have a false positive or not? And then we put it through simulations. We try to see if it's something observable in the near future. So um, every student or postdoc gets one molecule. That's too many molecules to go through if there's 15,000 molecules. So we also look at classes of molecules based on their functional group. Well, I want to tell you about a really interesting molecule that, that came out of this study, actually. And we didn't need this study to find the molecule of interest, but this molecule is phosphine. And phosphine is a phosphorus, in case you forgot what it is, it's a phosphorus atom with three hydrogen atoms. And phosphine's very, very curious because phosphine on Earth actually is only associated with life. Well, phosphorus is an essential element for all life on Earth. But on Earth, we have almost no phosphine because the phosphorus atom wants to go with oxygen atoms. You know, on Earth, we have almost no hydrogen. 
we have a lot of oxygen. So all phosphorus is essentially, most phosphorus is, presence in, the presence is in the form of phosphate. And it's really interesting too that phosphine appears almost to be absent from biology. So we discovered phosphine as a useful biosignature gas because on earth phosphine is only associated with life. Now, actually I mixed that up a little. Um, I'll get to that. So the biologists didn't like phosphine as a biosignature because we don't actually know the exact life form that makes phosphine. We think it's some kind of E. coli bacteria, but the biologists have not found the exact pathway through which life makes phosphine. Other people complained it's toxic and unstable. Indeed, phosphine was used as a chemical warfare agent during World War I. But I want you to know that there's incredibly strong evidence that phosphine, like 99.999%, phosphine is associated with life on Earth, life in oxygen-free environments, such as wetlands or inside animal guts. And phosphine, it is toxic and unstable for us, but that's only true in oxidized environments. So phosphine came to our attention two ways. One, because it seems to rarely be used by life. And the other way, because phosphine appears to have no false positives. It's at temperatures and pressures here on Earth's surface, it's nearly impossible to make phosphine. It's thermodynamically heavily disfavored. So I'm gonna talk about phosphine for a moment now. Some of you may have been following the story about phosphine on Venus, and I wanted to go through that a little bit briefly for you. This story actually starts with a radio astronomer named Professor Jane Greaves from the United Kingdom. And I want to encourage all of you actually to spend some part of your research, even if it's only a tiny part, on a far out idea. That to me is like, it's the joy of discovery, like the chance to you know push your brain and, and think outside the box. And so I'm impressed with Professor Jane Greaves because she, well, she decided she would try to search for signs of life on Venus, which is a really way out there idea. But what I'm impressed about with Professor Greaves is that she methodically went through the literature, biology literature actually. And oddly enough, she also discovered phosphine as a biosignature gas because it's not supposed to be on Earth. It's only associated with life, life in oxygen-free environments. And she also realized that phosphine had a, um, its a rotational transition um, from the ground to the first excited state falls in the wavelength region where she's an expert astronomer. So she proposed to use the James Clerk Maxwell telescope, this telescope shown here on the top, it's in Hawaii. And she was rejected, of course, but eventually got time. And around that point in time, our two teams, some mutual contact connected Professor Greaves' team with my team, because we were also working on phosphine for a completely different reason for exoplanets. So we were invited to join her team and to work on interpreting the, um, the reason, uh, the data. Um, she found a weak signal of phosphine with the James Clerk Maxwell telescope, then proposed to use ALMA. And if I was with you, I would ask if any of you use ALMA. It's a telescope array of numerous telescopes. Um, each of these are about, about, I think it's like 60, 60 different dishes. They're about 12 meters in diameter. They're in the Atacama Desert, so high, so dry. A great place for, for radio astronomy. Well, I'm not sure if you were following the news, but after many, many years of hard work, Professor Jane Greaves and team um, made an announcement about finding a sign of phosphine on Venus. And I wanna just back up for a moment to explain why this is so uh, out there. Because Venus, as you know, some of you will teach solar system astronomy, perhaps some of you work on, on solar system planets, but Venus is a terrible place for life. Due to a massive greenhouse atmosphere, Venus's surface temperature is so hot, no life of any kind could survive. Its temperature is 700 Kelvin, and it's too hot for complex molecules that are needed by life. Yet, since Carl Sagan, over half a century ago, people have dreamed about life in the clouds. Because just like on Earth, as you move up and away from the surface, 
the atmosphere gets cooler and cooler. And there's like a perfect layer that's around 50 kilometers above the surface where the temperature in the clouds is just right for life. Furthermore, all life needs liquid. And the clouds of Venus are made out of liquid sulfuric acid. Nonetheless, even the atmosphere of Venus is a terrible place for life. It's drier than the driest place on Earth, the Atacama Desert. It is, uh, the droplets are extremely acidic. But one thing in support of this concept is that life on Earth exists in our atmosphere. There's bacteria that's upswept from the surface that goes into cloud droplets. Some of it is freely floating. And the life stays up there for about a week before coming back down. So I'll get back to this in a moment, and I'm going to kind of quickly recap the phosphine on Venus story. So, oh, right, I did want to, let me see if I have time for this. Okay, so one funny thing, though, is when I started to think about Venus, I realized that a lot of the work is just speculation. It's very what you'd call hand wavy. So we try to put a little more quantification on the thought that there could be life in the clouds. Because... One of the problems is that if life is living in the cloud droplets on Venus, is that these cloud droplets, uh, they collide and grow. And eventually the droplets get too massive to survive in the atmosphere. They have to fall out like rain. But if they fall out, if they're always combining and growing, and there's no chance for fragmentation, you know, you have to ask yourself, how can life survive forever in the clouds? because eventually the life will fall out. And this plot here is showing you altitude above the surface in kilometers and the particle size in microns. And this uh, contour plot is showing you how long a particle might last in the atmosphere. This all comes from computer models that match the measured size distribution by space missions that went to Venus in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So you can see that some particles that are very large could last on the order of like these 10 micron particles um, could last many days, months even. Some very small particles could last years. The particles on Venus, they're, most of them are between two to 10 microns. So we're looking at this range here. So the particles could be up there for months to a year or so, that's fine. But what happens next? So I actually had a brainwave and I worked out a kind of theory. It's still kind of hand wavy, but a little bit uh, more quantitative. You can read my paper and see the relevant equations there. But we came up with this hypothesis of how life could stay aloft indefinitely. And there's a life cycle that we describe in our paper. And this is a cartoon showing you the Venus surface and the temperature is on the right side and the altitude above the surface is on the left side. And this word here, temperate zone, is showing you the layer where the temperature is just right for life. So the idea is that these cloud particles, the life in the clouds, they do, uh, the cloud particles collide, the particles rain out. But unlike on Earth, these raindrops will evaporate far before they hit the surface. They will actually evaporate around this lower haze layer. And what's mysterious about Venus is we don't know what the lower haze is made of. So my theory is that as the droplets fall down and evaporate, the life forms um, can become like a dried out spore. And they can populate this lower haze layer until these spores have a chance to be moved back up into the upper layers. Now Venus, this, it doesn't have convection like we have here on Earth at this stage, at this lower haze layer. So the particles can literally just stay there almost indefinitely until they have a chance to go back up where they would form um, cloud condensation. So what's funny about what I said is I just said everything with the straight face. And a funny thing is happening on Venus because it's getting a lot of attention now. And before it was considered taboo, like you'd get laughed at if you talked about life on Venus. And this is kind of what I'm here to tell you about is it's gradually moving um, into a kind of mainstream. Part of this started with phosphine where Professor Jane Greaves and the team I'm part of found a sign of phosphine on Venus. Now, just like on Earth, Venus has no hydrogen and the temperatures and pressures are completely unsuitable for phosphine to exist because there's no hydrogen and thermodynamically, it's phosphine's unfavored, it's very hard to make. 
So if there is phosphine on Venus, it's um, a mystery. It's either due to unknown chemistry or just kind of maybe possibly, maybe there's life making phosphine. So what my team did to, to help out was we worked out chemistry. We have a hundred page pa a paper that's like a hundred pages and we go through everything we know. Now we don't know everything because phosphine um, in this kind of environment, there's some missing chemistry, some reactions that are not, not measured yet. But we considered volcanoes, delivery of material by meteorites, lightning, surface minerals being swept up, and in each one of these cases, um, every process we could think of fails to make phosphine at the levels that we, we, we found. We found on the order of few parts per billion, tiny amounts of phosphine. Nonetheless, most of these methods um, cannot make phosphine, usually in like orders of magnitude uh, away from what we would need. So um, I want to make sure I have time to cover exoplanets. So I'm not showing you the data right now, but I'm more than happy to talk to you about the, the data. I wanted to give you a kind of update of where we're at right now. Well, when we announced this discovery, a lot happened. Uh, the first thing that happened was people uh, got angry, really angry with the chemistry. And they, everyone had their own theory of what could be making phosphine on Venus. But I just want you to know that now it's like 10 months after the announcement, nine or 10 months later, there haven't been any published papers on alternate chemical explanations. A more serious problem is the data analysis. We actually worked really hard on the data and other teams have looked at the data which is public and some of the teams have not found a signal. Now we have two separate data sets. One of the data sets is from the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and one is from ALMA. In the ALMA data, I, like, I hate to have to say this, but no, no other team has found the signal of phosphine. We need to heavily detrend our data. There's a lot going on. Venus actually is terrible to observe. You know, it's so bright. I bet it's brighter than anything anyone here has ever looked at, <laughs> that it's so bright. It is spatially resolved, and it's, it's hard to look at with a large facility. Like, you would never point the Hubble Space Telescope at Venus. Even with ALMA, it's a challenge to observe a spatially resolved bright object and looking for a tiny signal. Um, there's a lot more to the story I'm more than happy to share. We found a bug in the way that the ALMA observatory, well, ALMA observatory found a bug in the way they calibrated the data. It's rare to look at solar system objects with ALMA. We sorted through all this. There's a bunch of papers out, some from our team, some from other teams. Um, the bottom line is we need more data. We see a weak signal and it's our team stands by phosphine actually being there. Now what's really interesting to this story is that some teams have also looked at the JCMT data and they have seen the phosphine signal. So independent teams have found phosphine. But there, the other teams insist that it's not phosphine, it's sulfur dioxide. Because the only other feature that's close to the phosphine one zero rotational transition is a sulfur dioxide transition. However, we argue that you need way more sulfur dioxide than, well, by a factor of a few to 10 than has been seen before. So this debate is still going, but what I want you to walk away with is this amazing new work that's happening on Venus. An independent team revisited in situ data from NASA's Pioneer Venus, a probe that dropped down in the Venus atmosphere and it measured in situ um, what it did was it was a, it sucked in gas, ionized the gas, subject the gas to a magnetic field, it's mass spectrometry, and found evidence for phosphine. But the mass spectrometer, it only measures parent ions. So it's not like a sure thing, but it definitely has evidence for phosphine. So what my team, um, my team has been doing is we have been revisiting, my team and other people have been revisiting Venus. Look at this gorgeous pattern on Venus, this huge V-shape and this, these dark channels. This is a ultraviolet image of Venus. There's this unknown ultraviolet absorber and it absorbs something like, I wanna say it's half to two thirds of all solar radiation hitting Venus. And we have no idea what this UV absorber is. The life supporter folks on Venus, they wanna point this to being some kind of pigment. Imagine bacteria floating around that have a pigment that absorbs UV. 
But there's other things. There have been a measure of oxygen, O2, a tiny amount, and a gradient of oxygen in the clouds from three separate probes. Two were Russian probes, one was the NASA probe. And we dug, one of my team members dug back in the literature and there's a, a paper where someone confidently says, this oxygen measurement must be wrong because it's, it's impossible to have that much oxygen in thermodynamic equilibrium. There's several mysteries now. Under abundance of water vapor and sulfur dioxide in the cloud layers, there's also this tentative phosphine measurement and similarly ammonia from the uh, Venus probe. So this story gets a little detailed and it's not finished yet, but there is this, um, I love to like talk about my people and one of the new people I got to work with is a brilliant young chemist, an astrobiologist, astronomer, astrophysicist named Paul Rimmer. And he's been working on a theory with his photochemistry code to uh, re-explain why there's a lack of water vapor and I mean, even less water vapor than there should be in SO2. And it somehow ties all of these things together in a way that, that heavily supports that there could be some kind of, of life there. I hope I don't sound too crazy to you. I can't see you. It's like, I don't know if you're taking this seriously or if you think it's absolutely crazy. But I do have something more concrete to tell you. And that is I've been leading this study about going back to Venus. Like, we have not sent a probe to Venus in four decades. And it's time to go to Venus and to look in the atmosphere for disequilibria, for phosphine and ammonia and other gases. It's time for us to look at the particles again and figure out what the UV absorber is. And we're, we've been studying a mission. Um, we don't have a mission planned yet, but we have a really good idea that we're just finishing understanding. And we, we literally hope to involve the whole world in making small instruments to go to Venus and a modern trip to see what's going on there. So I wanted to give you something new to think about that perhaps you hadn't heard before. And that's why I spent so much time talking about Venus. So now I'm going to go uh, back to exoplanets and the search for signs of life. But I want to say that the phosphine story was a very hard, hard lesson for me personally because people don't believe the signal. They, if they believe the signal's there, they don't believe it's due to life. Even though we've sent over three dozen spacecraft to Venus, it's right next door and phosphine really shouldn't be there. So now let's imagine a planet far away where we have even less information. It just makes the whole endeavor to find signs of life much harder. Now, here's a common figure in exoplanets. Uh, let's look at the right-hand figure showing you planet size compared to planet period. Each point is a different planet. And there's, as you probably know, there's a lot of different ways to find planets. This is showing you uh, on a log scale. So there's planets that are the size of Earth. That's here, one Earth radius. There's planets that are 10 times or even 20 times the size of Earth. And these orbital periods, there are planets everywhere from thousands of Earth days or more to some planets that orbit literally less than one day. It's just astonishing how many planets there are. If you look out here where Earth is, though, this is a log-log plot. It's actually interesting that there's not very many planets around Earth. Earth is incredibly hard to find. And Earth is hard to find, right? It's not fainter than the faintest galaxies ever observed by Hubble. The problem is that Earth is right next to a big, bright, massive star. And I don't know um, how many of you get to work on exoplanets, but I love just putting the numbers out there. So Earth is tiny compared to the sun. It's 100 times smaller or 10,000 times smaller in area. Our Earth is 300,000 times less massive than our sun. And our Earth is 10 billion times fainter than our sun. So it almost seems like an impossible task to find another Earth. And if I could see you if I was there, I would ask those of you who don't work on exoplanets, I'd say, you know, if you were going to work on exoplanets, which method would you choose? One that involves planet size? 
one that involves planet mass or one that involves planet brightness. Because you can't see the planet directly in most of these cases, you have to look for the planet against the backdrop of the star. So anyway, it's a hard problem. Um, if you, you probably know that, um, which one is the easiest, it's transits. Just in case anyone doesn't know, a transit is a planet that goes in front of the star as seen from the telescope. You see a cartoon on the top and on the bottom you see a light curve. We measure the brightness of the star as a function of time. And perhaps some of you work with test data or have worked with Kepler data. It's incredible how, how this field is so mature now. To find planets with the transit method is very, very solid. And there's something special about these. Um, oh, I was going to tell you this funny story, actually. So I started working on exoplanets in the mid-1990s. And the first transiting exoplanet was discovered in 1999. And it was a huge, huge thing. Because having a planet transit right at the time that radial velocity said it should um, meant that it was like a clear-cut, solid case that it was a true exoplanet and not pulsations in the star or some other theory. And a few years later, after 1999, say in the early 2000s, it was time for me to look for a faculty job because I'd finished my postdoc and I was trying to become a professor. And I can't tell you the number of places I interviewed at where people, they literally just said that, well, it's great we have one transit or we had two transits at the time, but literally people would say, we're never going to have very many transits. <laughs> well, this field has totally grown. And all of these planets on this radius period diagram, they all transit. We have thousands of transiting planets today. And it's just incredible to see all the planets out there. There's a reason we love transiting planets. And that is so we can study their atmospheres. And this is going to be an important takeaway for you because in the future, when people claim they found a sign of life on an exoplanet, at least in the near future, this is the method we're going to use. Here you can see on the top right, the planet is in front of the star. And you can see this atmosphere, this artist's conception is showing you the atmosphere glowing as the planet is backlit by the star. And the way we find, study exoplanet atmospheres today is this way. When the planet's in front of the star, some of the starlight shines through the atmosphere. And I put a little equation here for those of you who know radius transfer. Essentially, it's just exponential attenuation of the incident intensity. Now, the way we think about this problem, I want you to imagine for a moment, we are observing the planet with a telescope and we're looking at a wavelength where the atmosphere is completely transparent. In that case, the transit is the, um, the drop in brightness is due to the area of the planet, this dark brown colored area. Now I want you to imagine that the atmosphere, that we're observing the planet at a wavelength where the atmosphere is completely opaque. So the atmosphere is now blocking the starlight at a given wavelength. Now we observe the planet transit and the drop in brightness is a tiny bit bigger because we have this whole extended area, the planet plus the atmosphere to look at. So what we're effectively doing is observing the planet at different wavelengths. And we are looking for a change in size due to the atmosphere, sometimes absorbing, sometimes not absorbing. And I picked this figure to show you one of the very best exoplanet atmospheres. This is transit depth. So this is the drop in brightness as a function of wavelength. This is microns. So this would be visible wavelengths on the left moving to infrared wavelengths on the right. The white points with error bars are Hubble Space Telescope data. And the colored curves are models. Uh, model fits to the data. Now you're supposed to look at this data and agree with me that it's different from a straight line. Because the planet looks a tiny bit bigger at certain wavelengths. And right here where the planet looks a little bit bigger, that's where there's a giant water vapor feature. It's a combination band of a rotational vibrational band of water. And this is really great because that means in this particular planet, we have, we, meaning it's not me personally, but we have found water vapor in this hot exoplanet atmosphere. And I just put a little number here. 
this is uh, one part in a thousand drop in brightness. <laughs> so that's an, an atmosphere observation. So why we're so interested in this is, well, today we study hot giant exoplanets with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we're all waiting for the James Webb Space Telescope to push down to small rocky planet atmospheres. The whole community will do everything we're doing now, but we will be observing smaller planets. And here's where I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna try to tell you something you might not know, but it's, it's a tricky business, let's just say. Um, first of all, we have to focus on small stars. And secondly, we have to hope that those planets orbiting the small stars have hydrogen dominated atmospheres. The small stars are simply because it's very hard to find Earth-sized planets in front of sun-sized stars. And the atmosphere is tiny compared to the backdrop of the whole star. For a small red dwarf star, the same size planet, it it's much easier to find because it takes out much more brightness. And the atmosphere also is, makes a much more significant impact. So all of the focus now is on small, small planets transiting small red dwarf stars. But there's another problem, and I'm not going to go through the math here, but <clears throat> some of you know it's an undergraduate problem to take an atmosphere of a planet, and if you consider it just for illustration to be isothermal, you can write down the hydrostatic equilibrium equation with the ideal gas law, and you end up getting this pressure equation. The pressure drops off exponentially with altitude. But how big that atmosphere is, or rather how fast the atmosphere pressure drops off, depends on scale height. And the scale height depends on mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. So the bigger the scale height, the puffier the atmosphere, the easier to observe. Well, if you look at this um, mean molecular mass here, for our Earth, our planet, nitrogen is dominant. For an exoplanet, if we can imagine there's an Earth-sized planet or a bigger than Earth-sized, super Earth-sized planet with hydrogen, this scale height becomes 14 times larger. And that makes this planet easier to, to see. And we're starting to think that except for the Trappist planets, which are very favorable, that it'll be nearly impossible to study small rocky planet atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope unless they have a hydrogen atmosphere. So um, I'm gonna have to skip this experimental thing and just tell you, I have just a few more things because I wanted you to know that not just my team, but other teams around the world are really ramping up to think about biosignature gases. And we use computer codes um, with basic equations. It's actually very complex. And I do teach a class, a graduate level class on this subject. And we honestly, we don't even scratch the surface in a one semester class because the details are so um, detailed. Um, we, we work on with these equations, conservation of energy, energy transport, that's rated to transfer, hydrostatic equilibrium, where the pressure gradient force is balanced by gravity, the ideal gas law, and the most tricky thing here is photochemistry. It's something that's not usually in the toolkit of an astronomer, stellar astronomer or planetary astronomer. These chemo photochemical equilibrium codes, they can have some nonlinearities that are really insidious. That is like you can have a molecule that catalyzes a reaction and that original molecule doesn't change its abundance, but it makes a big difference in a specific area. So we struggle with all this and teaching people how to use the codes. It takes a lot of training to do this. And not to overburden you, I just, you don't have to read this, but it was to remind me that this whole field now, I think in your fields as well, probably, people go a bit overboard in using, um, we call them retrieval methods because our equations are very nonlinear and too complex. You can't just write down a matrix and invert it. So you have to do a forward model with all possible solutions. And then to understand which models fit the data, you have to save some time. And so you have to do a strategic walk through multi-dimensional parameter space. And like other fields in astronomy, we use these retrieval methods, we call them based on Bayesian analysis. And we use um, Monte Carlo techniques to sample space properly. So I want to get towards the end of my talk now and return to phosphine, because we work with phosphine as a biosignature gas. And here I'm showing you 
it's a simulated spectrum of phosphine. So this is transit depth, drop in brightness, and this is wavelength in microns. And you're supposed to look at this plot and the, the points are fake data and the line is a model that fits the data. And there's two different curves. One is a plant exoplanet with phosphine. It's a hydrogen dominated atmosphere planet with phosphine. And one is uh, without. And there's a huge difference between these ones because we've put in a huge amount of phosphine. So we love phosphine as a biosignature gas, but it's um, it's it's you need a lot of this gas in order for it to be detected on an exoplanet. You need like um, parts per million, which actually is a lot for life to generate. So um, to summarize, there are a lot of next generation telescopes that we have available to us to observe small planet atmospheres. And it's going to be tricky to find signs of life, but that won't stop people from trying. So to summarize, we have lessons learned from phosphine on Venus. And the best way I can summarize that is that the search for signs of life by biosignature gases, I will just say it's the first part of a generation's long search. Small rocky planets are common. And exoplanet atmosphere observations by transmission spectroscopy are very well established. The James Webb Space Telescope is launching in 2021, and it will offer our first capability to observe atmospheres of small transiting planets. And the fast track for search on habit for habitable worlds focuses on small planets transiting small red dwarf stars, because those are the most favorable planets to observe. I just want to conclude by saying it's going to be a great future for exoplanets. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this wonderful talk. This is extremely clear. And the, the subject is undoubtedly fascinating for, for, I think, for every astronomer. And I, um, I will break the ice with my question because I think as many, uh, we follow the news on, on the detection of phosphine in the, in the clouds of Venus. And you mentioned that you, um, the conclusion was that you need more data and this data, would you, can you take it with ALMA or do you need uh, another facility actually for this? Well, the most honest answer I can give you is the best data is to go to Venus and go in uh, the yeah. atmosphere. Oh, I have a little a fun fact for you. So you can go in the atmosphere and use a spectrometer. It sucks in gas and it has a laser. It's a tunable laser spectrometer and it sends the laser back and forth, back and forth to create a giant path length. And they can see individual rotation lines. And guess what the spectral resolution is? The spectral resolution is 10 million. For any astronomers, that's like unattainable on Earth. So you want to go to Venus and get an unambiguous yeah. discovery. Now that exactly. said, we um, need to get more radio data with ALMA. We have looked for phosphine using the IRTF, using it's a three and a half meter infrared telescope, but it's hard to see beneath the clouds because in the mm -hmm. near infrared, you're looking at reflected light and it's coming off the clouds. So it's very challenging. Other people are gonna use SOFIA, the Airborne Observatory. Yeah. So people will keep trying to look for phosphine. Uh, well, it's really hard to do. Okay. So we, we hope for the mission. Let's go to Venus then. Well, the takeaway I wanted to leave you with, it's because you get to live through the story here, is that mm -hmm. phosphine is wonderful. It's a great story. It's controversial. We'll work on that. But it opened up. It like opened up the Pandora's box of Venus. Yeah. And I think that was the message I was trying to, to leave you with. Great. So, so let's quickly go to the other questions. Reinaldo, you can ask. Thanks a lot, Sarah, next. for the talk, very clear. I got very interested in this transmission spectroscopy. It's for me something new, brilliant. And I would like to ask when you have the data of this spectroscopy, at the same time, you get the information about the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, at the same time, uh, modeling the data, can you get some insights about the structure of the atmosphere or some uh, parameters of the planets? Well, with transmission spectra, you're measuring these rays that go along the limb. 
And it's not very sensitive to temperature, unfortunately, because, you know, along the limb of the planet, the densest part is like, you know, this is the planet, the densest part is like along that ray, there's one part that's really dense. And it turns out you sample mostly from a kind of concentrated area in the atmosphere. So it's not very sensitive to temperature. Um, the other problem is, okay, people ignore the three-dimensional nature of the atmosphere. Like a hot Jupiter is heated on one side, they're tightly locked. So night side, day side, hot on one side, cold on the other. And the models don't really capture all that at the moment because there's too many parameters to retrieve on. Finally, we're just starting to realize that photochemistry, it only affects the day side, not the night side. So there's a lot of layers there. So the answer is it doesn't help that much with temperature. And then the other stuff, it's a little too chaotic right now for us to sort through. However, people have made kind of measurements of metallicity. And that's kind of an interesting parameter to play with. Um, but everything I say, you have to add a giant error bar on it. Because depending on your field, you might have a different picture in your mind. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's move on to Eduardo's question. Hi, hello, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So when I heard the story about Venus and the phosphine and the observations with Alma and people disputing, uh, what I thought was, well, if, if we cannot be 100% sure about phosphine in a nearby planet as Venus using Alma, then we are not going to use this biomarker for any other planet. Yeah. But now, now you mentioned that the fact that Venus is so bright is, is a hindrance. So uh, it is phosphine uh, a useful biomarker for exoplanets? Okay, so there's a lot there. And I, I really, I don't know what to say because it, um, like my whole life, I was dreaming of finding a sign of life elsewhere. And Eduardo said it perfectly. It's never going to happen. So. Um, I didn't say that. Okay. I wanted to. Okay. I just said that for you. Okay. I translated what I thought. Yeah. So this is like, that's why I wish I could have visit you in person. Cause this, this would take like the whole night to like go out, have dinner, have a glass of wine and like talk about this because there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Let's imagine we get to launch a new telescope with a chronograph or starshade, and we see oxygen around every terrestrial planet that has water vapor. I think we're going to be pretty happy about that. Like we can't be 100% sure. And, you know, quantity doesn't make up for quality, but at the same time, we could have, we could imagine that. You know, if we see phosphine on this other world, on another world, and we don't see methane or we don't see ammonia, like that'll be intriguing. It won't be enough, but it will be, it'll be intriguing. And that's why in my um, summary, I said it's a generations long search. Because for our generation here, we'll find all this really exciting stuff. And then it'll have to happen over and over again, a bigger telescope, something different. Mm. Um, just think of like the cosmic microwave background radiation. When I was starting out in astronomy, we didn't see the first acoustic peak, you know, the temperature anisotropy on the sky. And now, wow, with Planck and everything, we have like all the details and now we're looking for inflation and we're looking for polarization. And that's 100 years since we first detected the CMB. So it could take a very long time. Now, there's other more crazy concepts out there we might have to invest in um, mm -hmm. to really see stuff. And I'll just tell you one, because I know there's more questions. But there's this thing called, OK, sorry. So I'm like the person for crazy ideas here today. Um, but this idea is called, this. it's not my idea. It's called Solar Gravitational Lens Telescope. So you send a telescope to 500 astronomical units. And it uses the sun as a gravitational lens. But you have to know exactly which planet you want to look at because they have to line up perfectly. And it would take you know, a long time for us to build this telescope. And it takes 25 years to get to its journey. And then you could have magnify incredibly. You could see down to 10 kilometer resolution. So I feel like you know, we'll find something interesting. And then the next generation, perhaps there's some people here today who have to think of what we're going to do next. Yeah, yeah. So just to complement, I was uh, specifically uh, wondering whether or not phosphine was particularly hard. So if there were other biomarkers that were easier to spot. On Venus, you mean? 
in general? Oh, in general, right. Um, I think oxygen is still the favored one because it's a very strong signal and there's really nothing else near it, but oxygen comes at visible wavelengths. And the James Webb Space Telescope will, you know, it kind of covers oxygen, but it will have a lot of noise at that edge of the detector. Um, the problem is that, you know, most gases have some problem. Like methane is a very popular biosignature gas, but methane is made geologically as well as by life. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of go down the list and there's some gases we like more than others, but we haven't found like one now, aside from oxygen, which people still fight against. There really isn't a magic biosignature right now, unfortunately. I really, I still really like phosphine though, because it has a unique place in the spectrum, no false positives, but there's really no easy answer. Yep. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, approximately five minutes. So Professor Jorge, can you please ask your question? Yes. Uh Excellent talk, uh, Sarah, very didactic. Uh, you mentioned that most molecules are not well characterized with laboratory spectroscopy or through theoretical calculations. So do you have to compute by yourself uh, all these molecular parameters like transition probabilities and so? Well, my team doesn't do it, but there's a couple of teams that do. One of them's in um, University of College London and they specialize in this topic, but it's very time consuming. It'll take one PhD to do one molecule, like a whole PhD. And the more atoms on the molecule, the more complicated it is. So we don't do that. And it takes a very long time to get that job done. Okay, uh, I guess that answered the question. So, Julia, would you like to ask your question, Julia? Uh, yes. Um, so, thank you, uh, Professor Sarah. Let me open my camera. Yeah. So, um, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I was just wondering, my question is very much in line with Eduardo's. Uh, I was just wondering if, I mean, I know phosphine has these uh, no phosphine positive is in radio wavelengths, but when it comes to infrared, do you, how, how easy do you think it would be to positively detect it in, I mean, in, for example, with James, James Webb in exoplanets? Well, exoplanets, it's very hard to observe in general because the signal's so tiny, you know, it's like that atmosphere against the backdrop of the star is very small and will need multiple transits. So we might see phosphine if life is producing a lot of phosphine. Like if there's life on another planet and it's producing like more phosphine than life on earth is producing methane, for example, then we have a chance to see it actually. But is that your question or? Yeah, yeah that was my question. It's just yeah. because I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't work exactly in this area. I understand. Yeah, but I was just wondering what is, the, Given that it's uh, infrared spectroscopy is basically the vibration mo movements of the molecules, how easy it would be to de to positively detect one individual molecule? I mean, and not oh, just a group of right. molecules. Um, some molecules are easier than others, but we're confident with phosphine. If there was a lot of it, we could detect it. Other molecules you'll never uniquely identify. For example, methane has a strong feature between three to four microns, yeah. but a lot of other hydrocarbons share that same feature. It would be yeah. very hard to find. So phosphine is pretty unique, actually. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think uh, that's all the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. And as you mentioned, we really hope that next time we'll be uh, together in the same place and then we can have a glass of wine and discuss <laughs> during dinner. And uh, these this, uh, subjects are really fascinating. So, everyone in, uh, want to say something, Eduardo, before we close yeah, the transmission? The, the idea to go to a restaurant, have discussions, and have a glass of wine was very triggering to me here at my home. <laughs> well, I would I, very I, much like that. 
Well, I wanted to wish everyone all the best with just the pandemic and coming out of yeah. it. And hopefully we can all get back to normal sometime. Thank you. Yes, we really hope so. And we really hope to have you next time. It will be at, at the Institute here in Brazil. Yeah. Thank you <laughs> again, Professor Sara. And also thanks everyone participating uh, in YouTube and here in Google Meet. Yes. Okay, so, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Many thanks, Professor. Thank you. Many thanks. Good to see you. Bye.